It's okay. This is why. This is actually a technique. One of the greatest public speakers of all time was silent for up to five minutes before he spoke. For this exact reason. So, don't get upset about it. That's what it's for. I mean, it was Hitler, but. <laughs> Anyway, so over the past couple of weeks, when it was my turn, not the puppet show, of course, but we've kind of been going over information, how to disseminate it, how to interpret it, how to verify it, see where it's coming from, so we don't depend on weird fact checkers and stuff like that, who are just agenda-based and biased anyway. But it is all coming to kind of a point, and there's a reason why you got to do it to use it, so to speak. <clears throat> so, I've been getting to kind of a few points with all of this. I know it seems like it's been kind of repetitive and all that, but just a little bit at a time to really drive home the point. The imitation of information. What? They can't just come out and say... We're amazing if they're not. No one's going to believe it. But how do you get people to believe a lie? You make it look like it is the truth in the first place, right? So it doesn't really have to be, but that's where a spiritual gift of discernment even comes in that you hear talked about a lot. So I wanted to get to one of the first points about it and how to use the information for it is mimicry. Hence the wheats and the tares we've been using a little bit. How, does the tares, how do the tares survive? They mimic wheat, something that we want to survive. That is actually how they've adapted. It's not like tares just always look like wheat. The ones that look the most like wheat were the ones that lived the longest and got to reproduce and wasn't picked up from that. So mimicry, what does it mean? From a Google definition, the action or the art of imitating someone or something, typically in order to entertain or ridicule. So, you know, you can mimic somebody like, oh, I'm Gary, you know, stuff like that. But <clears throat> there are other ways to do it, and a lot of it happens naturally, and a lot of it happens unnaturally. Mimicry. Insects. Who's ever seen one of these before? Stick bugs. Stick bugs, yeah. Some of them get really big, like four foot long. That'd be a pretty crazy stick bug. That's not a stick bug, that's a branch bug. We got lizards. I've never seen one of these before, but they look a lot like leaves. Other bugs. I don't know exactly what kind of bug this one is, but it looks a lot like the leaf. So do these. Have any of y'all seen these leaf bugs? I've seen these around a lot. What about this one? So some of them don't try to blend in with their environments. They try to mimic something meaner than themselves to survive, right? Even caterpillars, they do a lot of this too. They do something that birds don't like, such as snakes, so that they don't get eaten by the birds. Some snakes even try to look like meaner snakes to stay alive. So to the right, we have a coral snake, very venomous, poisonous, it'll kill you. And to the right, which is y'all's right, it will have a king snake, which is virtually harmless. I mean, it eats other snakes, so that's called king snake. But um, the mimicry, it looks like it, so people leave it alone because they're not sure. We even have it in certain other insects, like a certain type of fly, it's actually a beetle. It looks just like a hornet. So all the other ones leave it alone when it's around wherever it is. It becomes a king of wherever it's at. So a lot of this is just mimicry to survive, to not be devoured, right? So it's not necessarily camouflage. It's different than camouflage. Camouflage is using something around you like chameleons imitating that. You can kind of see how they mimic their surroundings. This is actually pretending to be something else for that. Well, what about mimicry to prey? So here we have a, what is this? And that's exactly what it wants you to think. It's a spider that eats ants. So it'll get its first two legs and make it look like antennas, but they're actually just spider legs, so that it can go in amongst the ants and eat them and devour them because they're like, oh, it looks like one of us. And then also, if you, uh, for any of our 
geeks and nerds and kids out there and video game players. <laughs> so mimics. They're mostly in games and stuff. They're treasure chests. And you go up to them like, oh, treasure. And you open them and they eat you and devour and you go attack them and fight them and stuff. And they also have like mimic ladders, mimic everything. They're actually enemies hidden to look like objects that are there to help you. But then we get to this little guy. Have I ever seen one of these before? They're a little bit different than the other ones. So these are actually three different beings right here. So they're snail, but it's not the kind of snail or slug you would think. So the official scientific Latin name for this is the Leo Cochloridium Paradoxum. What is a paradox? You might know what a paradox is? Oh, wow. It's like an impossible impossible conundrum. Yeah, an impossible conundrum. So the green banded brood sack is a better name if you can't, you know, you don't speak Latin or whatever. So it's a parasitic flatworm, and it's intermediate host or land snails, and they usually of the genus uh, Succinia or whatever. It's just the type of uh, the slug. But the pulsating green brood sacs fill the eye stalks of the snail, thereby attack or attracting predation by birds, which is their primary host. So what do these things do? It's not actually the snail, it's these guys. But as you can see here, they're all connected there kind of at the bottom. So what these do, they have a very, very odd life cycle. One of the oddest life cycles of any visible being. A lot of bacteria do this, but... So what they'll do is they will be eaten by a slug or the snail. And then as parasites, they'll grow in the snail. And when they reach adulthood, they will mate with each other or hook like we just seen there. And then they'll work their way up to the antenna or the eyes of the snail and start pulsating and be very colorful. And then they'll kind of mind control the snail to crawl all the way up to a very high visible spot of a plant or what have you, whatever it's on. So it becomes very attractive to birds. So the birds will fly down, eat them, they will die, the bacteria and the eggs will grow in the birds, the birds will dump them out, back onto the leaves in the ground, and the slugs will come and eat that. And then it starts all over again, and then they grow, go back to the eyes, the plant crawls up. So its whole purpose is to devour its host for the purpose of survival, for the purpose of breeding and reproducing. So you have to remember that its sole purpose is to be devoured. So what about biblical mimicry? Where does it come from in the Bible? You hear about it a lot. Let me say it a lot here. But So you have different kinds of mimicry biblically. So beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. I'm sure you've all heard this one before. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. By their fruits. Let's keep that in mind too. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So if this sheep is among us, but it keeps eating other sheep, pretty safe to say it's not a sheep, right? So that would be kind of what it's talking about. So another kind of mimicry. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, so they lie, they sneak, they mimic other brethren who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Spies, so to speak. To whom we give place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So when you find these spies or false brethren in it, they say to get them out immediately so the gospel might continue with you and not be brought in. Another kind we look at comes from Paul and what he was going through when he was explaining his daily lives or his monthly, weekly, yearly lives. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeys often in perils, waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, 
in perils among false brethren. So others come in to spy, to take you down from the inside. So these would come in to take advantage of your friendship, to take advantage of just you being around them and everything. They don't really have an agenda until it benefits them, so to speak. But I want to point out the one that sticks out the most, and it's one of the most overlooked ones. One of the most you just read by, and you're like, oh, see, bad. But when you break it down, it gets a lot more intense than that. So now we beseech you, this comes from 2 Thessalonians. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. So it's talking about getting towards the end. When we come towards the end of time, or when we get towards the end of the revelation, so to speak, is when you would read that, or revelation. It's kind of saying this is coming up. Here's what to watch out for. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. I guess you could call this a falling away, so we should have our guard up a little bit. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So this is what's called the Antichrist. Some people say, well, this is talking about Judas, but this is after Judas already did that. So no, it's not. <laughs> they, they call him the son of perdition too, but this is afterwards. So when you get into the mimicry of this, it comes from the fourth verse. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, Showing himself that he is God. So not only does he mimic to himself that he is God, but he sits in all these other places and does all these other godly things so that people would even think he is God. It's not a secret that Antichrist is going to have a pretty big following if you read what all happens and is going on there. A lot of it's by force, but a lot of it's just from people who don't know any better. That's why the first verses here were, hey, keep your guard up. I'm about to give you some insider knowledge as to not fall into this trap. So, you could call a temple. A temple could be a lot of different things in this sense. I'm not 100% sure which one to go with. But you could say yourself as the temple, so it could be literally in you. You could call the church the temple, so it could be in the church. Or you could just be in the souls and the worship and the head leading of people spiritually. Places where you should not be. But to the point where he shows himself... He is God. So why would the Antichrist want to be God? Why does anybody want anything? Does any of us want to be God? I definitely don't want to be God. I already told you last Thursday I was up here why I'd be a bad God. <laughs> I'd be killing everybody. Like, All right, well, you die, you die. So I'm not a good choice for that one. But think about the weather. What all does God control? Weather, right? Can any man control the weather? Yes. Man can start controlling the weather. So Operation Popeye in Vietnam, you heard we made it rain to flood out all the roads so they couldn't navigate, move the flood them out of the tunnels and all that. And then you have war in the weather, the artificial production of rain. This was in 1871, so it was even predated from all of that. And then the new... U.S. Soviets proposed ban on weather war. They call it biological warfare. That counts as biological because you know it still counts as weather. It's natural events and all that. So you can mimic the weather. Here's how that works, how they do it. They can shoot actual projectiles up there. They're called silver, silver uh, oxide, iod, silver iodide, sorry. And it just attracts the water and all the water starts falling down from that. What about plagues? God sent the plagues onto Egypt, right? Can man mimic plagues? <laughs> we should be pretty akin to this one, right? There's a man made in the lab, oh, lab leak, whether you believe it came from China or one of the other ones that the U.S. funds. They're mimicking plagues from that. And what else comes in plagues? Mass die-offs. So the past few weeks we've been talking about how they're burning down farms to cause plagues and famines across the land. The mass destruction of animals everywhere. Did y'all hear about the recent heat wave that killed tens of thousands of animals in Arizona? It's been hot in Arizona for a long time. It hasn't killed tens of thousands of beef 
or cows or anything like that. I've seen it. So then you get to the yeah. So then you get to famine, where the people don't eat. Now we're seeing all the egg factories burned down, the food processing plants burned down, the distribution chains disrupted, where truckers can't get food to here or there. Also, kind of becoming man-made, as we can see there. So the mimicking of a famine, signs and wonders. Do you think there's going to be a mimic of signs and wonders? It does. It says that. But how can you mimic signs and wonders? What can somebody do that makes people think it's God? 